Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, firstly, the GIMS team would like to extend a very warm welcome to you all and also to our guest speaker, Professor Bill Mitchell. Now, many of you will already know us, but for those that don't, my name is Prue Plumridge, and along with Claire and Sarah, we are three of the original five founding members of the Gower Initiative for Modern Money Studies. The seeds for the, of the organisation were planted just four years ago at an event in London at which Bill was a keynote speaker. And now here we are in Brighton, a year on almost from our launch in London last October. It's been a bit of a whirlwind and indeed a bit of a learning curve. We are living through very uncertain times. In the peaceful years of my early childhood and youth, I could never have imagined the challenges we will be facing today. So much has changed in my 65 years. I find it a frightening pros prospect, not so much for myself as for my grandchildren, who will face the consequences if we fail to act. The threat posed by climate change combined with the already damaging poverty and inequality which has arisen out of the pursuit of harmful market-driven ideology means that it is now absolutely crucial that we stand in solidarity to demand that our politicians act with urgency. As they say, there is no planet B. On Friday last week, it was really moving, and I'm sure you probably will agree with me, to see so many thousands of young people, and adults too, congregate in towns and cities across the world to demand action from their leaders. Greta Thunberg, whose single protest outside her government's parliament has now grown rapidly into a worldwide school strike movement, and along with Extinction Rebellion, is raising the stakes with a dual objective to raise public awareness and make politicians sit up and listen. The Green New Deal is increasingly becoming a byword for radical action both in the US, the UK and Europe. And it is seen as a challenge to the current <laughs> destructive economic paradigm and aims to address both the ecological crisis we are facing as a result and the associated poverty and inequality which accompanies it, not just in the global north, but in the global south too, where people have borne the brunt of exploitation that feeds the Western world's excessive consumption. However, whilst radical action is vital, how we pay for it is often than not couched in the language of household budgets and commandeering the wealth of the rich. Some ask questions about where the money will come from and its monetary affordability, even though it's our survival that is at stake. So, with the answers to those questions and an opportunity to explore the Green New Deal and the job guarantee in more detail, I have great pleasure in welcoming our esteemed guest, Professor Bill Mitchell, up to the podium. Bill is a leading proponent of modern monetary theory and director of COFI, the uh, Centre for Full Employment and Equity. He's written extensively in the fields of macroeconomics, econometrics and public policy. His most recent book, Macroeconomics, jointly authored with Professors L. Randall Ray and Martin Watts, was launched earlier uh, this year in London. And uh, if afterwards uh, you would like to take a look, there are copies for sale at the end. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Bill, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Prue, and uh, thanks to the GIMS people. They, this is a small group of activists who do work on the smell of an oily rag, as they say, and uh, it's great that you can come and support them and uh, hopefully you can get behind them in, in the period ahead and uh, help them out. 
Now this, uh, the Green New Deal and uh, the heading here is, a, is just a sort of tentative working title in my mind. I actually don't like the term. It's just at the moment we're just using that. Uh, and um, where I... And by the way, you know, I'm not talking at all about climate issues today because I'm an economist, I'm not a that sort of scientist. So I don't know whether we're going to have enough battery storage or whatever. I read the literature as a, as a person who's trained to read scientific literature and I can, I can uh, understand uh, statistics and uh, hypothesis testing and all the rest of it. I'm a mathematical statistical person from background. And so I sort of have a, a, an inkling and that, and a confidence that the science literature on climate is probably accurate. And like, as a, as a um, statistician myself, uh, I understand standard errors, and so, uh, and I understand uh, forecast errors, and so, you know, I'm, we're not necessarily going to pin them down to 12 years or 14 years or 25 years or 50 years, but it's happening, and, so I'm not talking about that at all today. I'm talking about the economic and social aspects that I see are relevant to this debate. Uh, and the first thing that, that I think is missing in the debate so far, although there are groups that are starting in this way, is that we've really got to, you know, for this to work, uh, and to, as, you'll, as you'll hear, I think this is a dramatic, a dramatic transformation required, not just around the edges anymore, then we have to have social purpose. N none of the big changes in history have been, have been uh, managed peacefully and uh, effectively unless, unless everyone buys into it. And, and um, that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that... Um, There's been a lot of play on the concept of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal in the Great Depression of 1930s. And that's where Green New Deal comes from. And, uh, and I don't like that because uh, if you go back and understand what the new FDR's New Deal was, it was what I call, as an economist, call a cyclical measure. It was a response to a massive collapse in non-government spending uh, rising unemployment, dramatic meltdowns of communities, particularly farming communities in, in, the, in the US, and the government understood that the existing economic logic, which we now would think of as being sound finance, it's a prevailing logic again now, was going to lead them to ruin. And so they needed a, what we now call a massive fiscal stimulus, which uh, provided relief in the form of cash handouts and jobs, uh, temporary jobs, while the mess of the 1929 financial collapse worked its way out of the system, all of the debt was restructured and, and, and we could get resume normal um, coverage, normal behaviour. And so it really wasn't a major structural transformation at all. There was, there was one element that had longer lived effects and that was the, 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 the legislation to restrict banks and the financial markets, Glass-Steagall Act. And there were obviously legacy uh, re um, outcomes and benefits of some of the large capital work, public works program, po projects that were put in place, like Yosemite National Park, the Tennessee a hydro scheme and those sort of developments which deliver benefits to this day. And in Australia, for example, I tell the story that uh, in the 1930s, if you've been to Victoria in Australia, one of the greatest tourist uh, um, facilities is called the Great Ocean Road. And it goes down from Ang Geelong, sort of, down to Apollo Bay, right along the southwest coast. And that's, um, you know, all of the beautiful surf beaches and that down there, the holiday places. Um, a multi-million dollar 
annual tourist incomes generated from the traffic that goes down there, well, that was built in the Great Depression by, the, by men, including my grandfather, who dug, dug the road out of the cliff. And I use that example to, to, to disabuse people who say that government, large-scale government projects like this can't deliver long-term sustainable benefits. But the point was that the Green New Deal was not a major structural shift. I'm just going to adjust this. Whereas in the way I'm constructing and I, I, I hear people talking about the Green New Deal coming from all different quarters is that they perceive it being much more than just a, a fiscal stimulus to correct fluctuations in non-government spending which would lead, which if weren't corrected would lead to re recession. The, the way they're, they're thinking about it is that it's going to be a, 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 a major structural shift in, in the way we produce output, the way we, uh, our, the jobs that we will have available to us, uh, the, our consumption patterns as households, major shift in all of those things, which will, which will be transformative rather than temporary stimulus of government. And it will, in my view, fundamentally alter the, 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 the contribution of the public sector via v the private sector in resource allocation, bias towards the public sector. We're going to have to accept, in my view, bigger governments with greater command over, on, over the productive resources and greater regulative and uh, authority We've, in the neoliberal period, we've shifted to a position where the government has taken increasingly hands-off positions and allowed the so-called market to distribute and uh, patterns of, uh, of infrastructure and investment and production. Well, we're, that's going to have to change. And that's a, that's a permanent shift, not just a temporary stimulus. And that'll mean that we, we're going to have to get used to again, in my view, a fundamental role in our economic lives of go and social lives of government. So back in the early post-war period, we accepted that the government was a major employer, was a, was a, you know, this was the nation building era after the havoc of Second World War, particularly in Europe. But it was also the case in, the, in, in, in my country that this was the big, the, 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 the big large leap forward in nation building. And we, we, we accepted that the government was the leader in that process because it had the financial capacity and, and the planning capacity and all of that. We wouldn't have dared left that to private profit making decision making. And that's what's going to have to accompany a Green New Deal. Now, why not rely on the market then? And one of the reasons... So, so a lot of uh, progressives, for example, and uh, we were in Edinburgh uh, over the weekend and I heard the same story from the Greens there. They, they say, oh, well, we've got to deal with uh, 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 climate change. We've got to reduce carbon usage and, and those type of things. And so therefore what we've really got to do is fix up the market so that it will provide price incentives to older consumption patterns away from carbon intensive and penalise carbon intensive firms so that they've got an incentive to reinvest in non-carbon intensive processes. And so the price system is going to be the allocative vehicle to make those transitions both on consumption and production side and all we've got to do is rejig the market system as so that it sends the correct price signals to to allow that to happen. Now I, I reject that outright. The, the first point that I make is that, that this is a neoliberal construct to believe that the price system 
the price incentives are the most effective way to get socially desirable outcomes in resource allocation, production and consumption. And so as soon as you're buying into carbon taxes, uh, uh, emission trading schemes, which are the, the major way in people think about these resource allocation shifts, you, in my view you're just adopting what I think is neoliberal logic and you're falling back into that that trap and I'll talk about more that about more about that in a moment and when you think about it emission trading schemes are just private uh, uh, another example of privatizing in this case our commons which we all have a ownership of if not in legal title in something deeper than that and the other thing is that these emission systems and the European system that's been in place for many years now is a great example of this. They allow uh, offset schemes, and this is a SOP. So what they have is a market system and then they increasingly dilute the, 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 the price signal uh, by allowing all sorts of SOPs to the polluters. So they have these carbon offset schemes. So a huge polluter in Britain can uh, buy some offsets by investing in some third world country like northern India or somewhere else and they'll get a, get an offset and they can keep happily compu uh, polluting in their first world area. And then you do some studies of these uh, investments that have been uh, uh, put into poorer countries uh, and, and it's a horror story the destruction of local culture. So they'll go in and build a, say, a, a water system or something like that. Local local governments in these areas are corruptible and they get bribed by the money and, uh, and you see uh, local subsistence behaviour trampled, local cultural artefacts trampled and it's a nightmare. S meanwhile, back at the ranch, the, the, the main polluters are still polluting. And market-based systems are totally insensitive to equity issues. And as you'll see from in a moment, that one of the most important challenges of this whole climate debate from a socio-economic perspective is the equity challenge. And so you try to have, a, you know, market system works on dollar votes or pound votes or euro votes. Those who've got the most dollars have got the most votes, the most influence and the most power. And no equity considerations at all in, in a market system. And the most important thing and that, that, that my profession, e economics, is deficient in, is we have this view that there's a trade-off between goods and bads. And so we've got, the, we've got to allow the price system to come up with a Optimal trade-off is, is a language we use between pollution and production. And so we, we want to have the optimal amount of pollution is the way, if you read the literature from economics. Now, the problem is that it's all very well to conceive of it in that way, but by... Economists can't tell you, and the price system can, can't tell you when a river system is going to die. This is beyond uh, uh, dealing with inanimate objects like uh, cars and uh, pieces of uh, uh, cans of fruit. And so, trust, trying to leave these really massive decisions to a price system when it has no concept of. Uh, Biological insecurity is is a is doom will will doom us, and so I've always argued, and it's totally contrary to my profession, of course, but that's been the nature of things, is that if the scientists are right, and we've got to stop something, then you need a regulative process, a, a rules based response. And rules can only come from the legislature. So in, I, I live in Newcastle mostly, and that's on the east coast of Australia. The port of Newcastle is the largest coal exporting port in the world. 
and up the up the valley, the Hunter River Valley is where all the mines are. Well, I'm afraid that we're going to have to tell those mines, which are a major export for Australia, that they've got to shut. Not put a carbon tax so that they don't have as much demand for their products. We've just got to shut them down. And we've increasingly got to leave stuff in the ground for to deal with this problem. And, and as you'll see, that's a massive... Uh, my opinion on that is that's massive. And I think that's going to be a major... Not necessarily a flaw, but a susceptibility to failure of this whole Green New Deal agenda. Now, here's the other thing. And I read this morning that uh, there's a lot of pushback in America now. And this Greta Thunberg teenager is, is talking about this now. And I don't know how... A 15-year-old has this maturity, but she's either incredible or getting solid backing from adults. But the, the latest line is that if we link the green new, the climate issue with a liberal agenda, and liberal in the proper meaning of the word liberal, so, you know, workers' rights, uh, community rights, uh, employment, education, infrastructure, all of the socio-economic aspects that have been included in a Green New Deal discussion. Her, her, the argument coming out now from her camp and other camps is that that will be a, a recipe for failure because the Conservatives will never buy it. And so therefore, and climate is a problem for all of us, whether you, where, wherever you sit on the spectrum, and so we should only really concentrate on the climate and ignore all of the liberal agendas that are being attached to that issue. Now, that's one view, it's not my view, because to, to establish that view, you've also got to be able to establish the proposition that there's no causal link between the growth of neoliberalism and the dominance of neoliberalism in policy making and the climate issues. There has to be no link if you think you can just deal with the climate issues alone. Now, I happen to think that you can't construct the climate agenda without a social agenda. And one of the reasons for that is because dealing with the climate issue is going to have massive impacts upon our societies. And if we do, if we have jobs, communities, because the, the climate impacts aren't spread out across all of us, they're concentrated in regions and communities and occupations and genders. M males are going to be much more impacted immediately in job terms than females. And if you do, do that within a sound finance, a neoliberal economics framework, well, then you're not going to uh, have justice to the communities that are affected. So I think these things are interrelated and have to, uh, and it makes the problem greater, and the solution is much going to be much harder to achieve. And the other thing, if you leave it within a sound finance uh, framework, the current type of way of thinking about economic policy, and I heard this from a, a green person in uh, Edinburgh on Saturday, is that. Uh, uh, her line was that the financial markets, again, we want the financial markets to come involved, become involved in green issues and fund them. Well, as soon as you uh, privilege that these uh, neoliberal financial markets, then the, the agenda's hijacked for further speculative casino-like greed behaviour. End of story, we may as well jump, take a long walk off the, a very short pier into shark-infested water. Now this just goes... So in other words, what I think is, and this is this point here, that if you do construct it within a broader discussion about neoliberalism and the damage it's causing, well then that provides you with the 
it helps define the scope of the initiative. If it's just a matter of having a few wind farms here or there or whatever, then you really have a very narrow initi initiative. If you construct it within a broad response to the failure of neoliberalism to deliver prosperity for us, which in part has led to uh, an acceleration in the climate damage, then you've got a much broader agenda. And so the, 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 the and you know, the, I don't expect you to read all that. It just tells you all of the things that neoliberalism, the characteristics of neoliberalism and the manifestations of neoliberalism, all of those things are undermining prosperity. They're, they're fracturing communities. Uh, they're reducing the capacity of workers to maintain uh, income growth and therefore to maintain consumption growth. They're being increasingly led into unsustainable private debt situations which are being fed by financial markets that are increasingly unregulated and unsupervised. And so you've got a whole nightmare there and each one of those I could give a talk on about the, what's happened in those in, under each of those headings. You've got compromised education and training systems, compromised research processes within my profession, the within the university system that I come out of and so on and so forth. And so that informs what I think are the Green New Deal elements. And uh, if you then just think, read through some of those things, you've got, you've got a, a, a major systemic change to be achieved, not just tinkering around the edges. And for example, in the neoliberal uh, shifts in uh, energy production and supply, that's unsustainable. That's all got to go back into the state hands. Transport systems have got to go back into state hands. Uh, a financial market has to be uh, has to be massively changed. If you if you understand uh, that only about two percent of all financial market transactions, the trillions of transactions that are going on, about two percent of them actually are what we would call productive. And what I mean by productive, uh, the speculative transactions that allow, say, a manufacturer to hedge foreign exchange exposure if they've got uh, their revenue in a foreign currency and their costs in a domestic currency, then that sort of uh, someone who will give them a forward contract and guarantee the, uh, the, you know, to eliminate any exchange rate shifts so that their revenue is predictable in relation to their costs. That sort of speculation is what we would call productive. Because someone who's not the manufacturer, who's not in the business of taking that sort of risk, they take the risk of the enterprise, of being able to match the market demand to their production. That's a risk in itself. But their risk shouldn't be in financial market insecurity. Well, that sort of speculation is productive. That's about 2% of all financial transactions. The rest of it is wealth shuffling, casino gambling, and when it goes wrong, it impacts on all of us. And that should be eliminated under my view of a Green New Deal. Now, then you say, OK, pie in the sky, Bill. And, you know, I'm not stupid. So what I'm saying is that that tells you the scale of the challenge we're facing. The financial markets, as, we, as they exist now, can't get their hands on this at all, in my view. We don't need them, as I'll explain later, we don't need any of their investment money to make the appropriate infrastructure and technological developments and labour transitions and education and training transitions. We don't need their money. We need them to be declared illegal because they don't do any purpose in developing well-being for the population. That's what. So the Green New Deal is a philosophical shift as well. Okay, so this is the next major thing to confront and uh, dealing with the winners and losers. 
Now, about uh, 14 years ago, we did a lot of work for Greenpeace, my, my research centre, uh, Coffee Centre of Full Employment Equity, and what we were modelling for them, doing sort of quite sophisticated uh, uh, models, was the the scale of the uh, in, uh, labour market shifts if we closed down the coal industry in in Australia, and could we get it, could we do it? And was there an ability to trans, trans uh, to shift into renewables? And what would be the labour market impacts on that? And within that work, we developed a just transition framework. Because if you close down the coal industry, well, then a lot of communities just out west of Newcastle, where I live, are going to be devastated. That's their that's their livelihoods. Their mortgages are dependent upon the mining industry. The public, the, the private infrastructure, the social clubs, the sporting clubs, all of it's dependent upon the incomes that flow from that industry. Close it down, restrict it, and those communities are wrecked. And uh, so this is, this is a crucial thing, the to, component of a Green New Deal. The only thing is that a lot of people are using this concept now in the current debate and they really haven't got a clue where it came from, who developed it and what was the emphasis. And that's what I'll talk about in the next few minutes. And uh, the, the framework entered the debate in around the mid-90s. And the question was, how would you react? How would each one of you react? If you're employed by a chemical plant, was the example used by the author of this quote, and that all of your your uh, in, your income, but not only your income, but your future super pension entitlements, all of your you've been working all your life in this chemical plant in your local area, all of your future prosperity and your current prosperity is dependent upon it. And some green groups then come along, the environmental groups come along and get court orders to shut it down rather than to uh, uh, maintain investment in the plant which main sec secures your jobs into the future. How would you react? And, you know, I would... I don't know what I would do if I was caught in that situation. And that's sort of a, a way of a, a question to ask yourself in this case because it really can, is, it goes to the heart of the, the issue. And the author of that little example was Brian Kohler, who was a, 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 an official of that union in Canada. The, and it was particularly the energy component was the, the issue. And he made a famous uh, speech in December the 5th, 1996, and he said that the real choice is not jobs or the environment, it's either both or neither. It's either both or neither. And what he was arguing... was that if green groups come and, or society comes and threatens to close down a chemical plant or a coal-fired power station, then what sort of quandary does that put the workers in that plant in who may be totally on side of the environmental debate but are going to be the ones that bear the costs of the closure? And so the Just Transition Framework was trying to develop a way in which those costs wouldn't just fall on those workers and wouldn't distort those workers' choice set. Because I can imagine if I was in that situation, I'd worked all my life in a, in a, a sector and my, I was about to retire and my retirement was dependent upon that, the, the pension that had been developed by that firm for me and suddenly that firm's confronted with having to close, well, then I'd probably, as you'll see, I would probably join the employer and resist that, even if I was green. That's, that's the sort of conflicts we have in our lives. 
And the just transition framework is an attempt to resolve that conflict so that it produces good outcomes for everything, on every dimension. And this is, this is what he said to the, in his speech to the activists. If you attack us in the workplaces, if you under, fail to understand the jobs issue, you will force us into an alliance with our employers and then everybody loses. And, you know, I've had over my career, uh, I've had a, a lot of interchange and disagreements with the Australian Greens because, in, you know, they, they'll go into a regional area, in, in New South Wales, for example, and they'll have protests about uh, forestry and they demand that the forest industry gets closed down. And that's a, that's a reasonable demand given the damage that that industry is, is doing. But that's, that's where they leave it. They go back to Sydney and leave it at there. And what does the community say? Well, these greenies from Sydney are coming up, these cosmopolitans are coming up to here. All they want to do is uh, barricade the access to the forests and stop us doing our job. There's no op- they give us no hope. There's no option. They're not presenting us with any option. They're just saying that they're going to stop something, not, not produce something. They're going to stop something. And that something happens to be of central importance to those people's lives, their, their livelihood. And so Brian Collar got it right. If, you, if, if, if the environmental movement confra- con- constructs the New Deal as going in and stopping environmentally damaging behaviour, and that's where it's at, leaves it, then the workers are always going to side with the employers who resist that. And, and that's his state, that's, he said that to uh, bosses that, uh, you know, we don't trust you to do the right thing. Everything's uh, dirty, but if you don't look after us, we don't trust you to, uh, uh, to do the right thing by the environment also, unless you cooperate with us to help us make the transition. So the genesis of the Just Transition Framework, which is out there now, everyone's talking about it, w- was not really about the way it's been constructed now. It was about the jobs issue and the cost sharing issue. And that that had to be that was central to the development of this concept. And my view is that that's the key issue that we have to come to terms with. Okay, so so these are some elements of a just transition framework. That it has to be transparent that everybody's got to know what's going on. There's got to be consultation between government, workers, firms, contractors, uh, regional interests. And if there's not, if it's top down and heavy, then it's not going to work. It's not going to be just. As a as a society, we're going to have to accept, in my view that workers that are displaced and contractors that are displaced, small businesses and those type of activities, are going to should be should expect to be fully compensated in money. Uh, not any sort of half baked, short lived things. And uh Contractors who are told they're not able to work, in, not able to contract anymore, we should expect as a society that the government will buy all their equipment out. It's unfair otherwise. So the dollar figure's rising. And we've got to work out ways in which to promote the development of good environmental. Because we're not going to, we're not, while we want people to turn power off uh, their lights down a bit and not use as much power, that's not going to be the solution. So we need better ways of generating these things. But that's not going to happen unless we have uh, massive investment. And that, that investment has to come from the government. Otherwise, it will be perverted to the private financial market ends. So we need to develop, uh, um, coherent access to credit. And then you've got the debate. 
it's not up there, but you've got the debate as to whether it's the, whether a progressive society should have the government currency capacity subsidising private profit or not. In other words, should all of this investment be strictly in the public sector for not-for-profit or should the government give largesse to private profit-seeking providers of good technologies and stuff? It's a, I, I've got a, an opinion on that, but that's a question that has to be answered in this and I'm sure that the opinions will be divided. So how do you de- uh, resolve that conflict? And I've already hinted my opinion on this, we have to basically eliminate the financial sector from being a speculative Gordon Gecko outfit. And we need to have much more uh, uh, public oversight and involvement, and I'd prefer just to have public banks and public pension funds and get just get rid of the speculative stuff. But, but there's got to be a debate about that because, that, because if you think about that, that's, that's, the, that's woven right into the heart of our society now. And if we're really talking about a transformation that large, what are we going to call it? Is it socialism? And the issue that arises then is can a Green New Deal really be accomplished effectively within the capitalist system as we know it? Now, I I don't know. I've got got opinions, but go back to my first slide. We've got to achieve a social consensus on this somehow. And are we going to... Do we have to tear down the capitalist system to achieve this? Or can we do it within capitalism? I, I doubt it. But, and then there's all debates about whether it's democratic socialism or what you know in the Bernie Sanders mould, or something more extreme. Who knows? But these are the sort of dimensions that we've got to be having debates about in society. Uh, removing price distortions, this, this is sort of more classic thinking because what this relates to is the concept in economics of externalities. And uh, what, what this means is that uh, if the price at which a good is sold at or offered at doesn't reflect the full, full costs or benefits, depending on what sort of good it is, product, then there will be either overconsumption or underconsumption. So the example of overconsumption is if uh, is uh, a polluting company that's causing dramatic damage to the environment that's not being they're not being charged for. So you know, commons going past, a river going past, or something, or the air that's our all of us, and that cost to the world isn't factored into their margin, and so their price is lower than it should be, and so there's over. Supply and over demand. And the Green New Deal really has to address those sort of anomalies in through taxation and subsidies. Research and development, huge amount of research and development is going to be required. Now over over the last 30 years or something, research and development uh, investment and, and most research and development works through the university system or, or adjuncts to the university system. That's the fact. The private sector, depending which country you're in, but the private sector typically just piggybacks and is more parasitic than active. And what's happened is that we're starting to get distor- at universities are get austerity all around the world in different degrees in different countries. They're starting to attack universities by cutting their funding. And so universities then look to their senior professors like me to become cash cows through research to generate the gap that's lost through government funding. And what increasingly is happening is that senior researchers like me are falling prey to corporate interests 
who see that they can put money into a university, get cheap research, and with conditions. So my university, for example, which I've really been struggling against for years on this issue, as you can expect, the proximity to this huge coal industry gets massive amounts of investment funds from the coal industry. What do they do? What, what's the research? Clean coal. And, you know, the scientists who aren't being funded by coal industries tell you that clean coal is not going to ever happen. It's not possible, yet, yet universities are being compromised by this funding because of government cutbacks. So that's all got to stop. Research and development is our future material well-being. And, uh, at, and we need government to step back up to the, the plate. Uh, obviously, redeployment and relocation money has got to be made. One of the huge problems, and this is a real equity issue, that uh, a person like me, a professional, well-paid professional, I've got no problem with, with uh, geographic mobility. I can get my, the labor, my labour market's the world. But low-income earners tend to be much more geographically tied because of the nature of their jobs and their, and, and their officially measured skills. And so they... The, and, and the other aspect of that is housing because depressed areas tend to have uh, less inflation in the real estate market and the more prosperous areas where new jobs are emerging tend to have inflation, uh, asset price bubbles in real estate. And so if you want to try to get a, a worker to transit from a low-income job in Region A in decline to a low-income job in Region B, which is growing, then you've got a huge problem because those workers won't move because they can't afford to move in terms of real estate. What do we do about that? Are we going to, are we, uh, are we going to have to fund all of the gap, make sure that they can buy into the new market? And then what do you do about renters who, who don't even have the ownership of home, which is an increasing problem given the housing affordability crisis that's emerged under neoliberalism? They're huge issues. Uh, of course we need skill development. And uh, that increasingly has been undermined by neoliberalism. So Australia used to have a really coherent apprenticeship system. And so for kids like me, I was more academically inclined, couldn't saw a straight line or hammer a nail properly. I kept bending in woodwork classes. So I went on and was able to go to university. But other kids who were who could do beautiful things with their hand-eye coordination and their spatial abilities to do engines and all of that, carpentry, they could always get an apprenticeship in and, and make something of their lives in working lives that way. Well, that all went. Now we have these so-called new apprenticeships, which I, we call them now burger-flipping apprenticeships. You get subsidised for three months to learn to work in McDonald's, for God's sake. That's all got to change. We've got to have uh, a, a new approach to skill development so that workers can upgrade their skills if, they are in, if they're wanting to and can get new skills in new technologies because technology is always shifting. It's not just a climate issue in this case. Obviously, public infrastructure development, we're going to basically have to take, I don't know how many cars, but a lot of them off the road, and in, uh, in my country, we're all car dependent. And what are we, how are we going to get around? We're going to need really sophisticated mass transport systems. We came up from Paris uh, to Maastricht the other day uh, on the TELUS, the fast train. And when you log into the Wi-Fi, you get a portal and it shows you how fast the train's going. 300 clicks an hour. And I did a calculation. It takes from Newcastle to Sydney, Newcastle where I, I mostly live, to Sydney. That takes just on three hours by, by train. If we had have had a fast train, it would have taken 38 minutes. Now, can you imagine? And, and Sydney's groaning under congestion and infrastructure problems because everyone wants to go to Sydney because that's where the jobs are. 
And can you imagine an investment in a fast train from Newcastle to Sydney, 20, 38 minutes, you'd be able to commute into Sydney and take all of that environmental strain off that, that part of the world. That's what's needed. These are major transformative shifts in the way we think about public infrastructure. And the neoliberal uh, era has been marked by the degradation of public infrastructure because it's much harder to inflict austerity, austerity if you cut pensions and things that impact today. So the, the way they, they can inflict austerity with, and get away with it over a political cycle is by stopping investing in bridges and all the rest of it. When I was doing my PhD in Manchester, during Maggie Thatcher's... Uh, Manchester, England, uh, during Maggie Thatcher's reign, there was a rat plague in central Manchester and it was discovered that two rat collectors had been cut from the waterways as a cost-saving measure. And to clean up the rat plague would have cost much more than the lifetime incomes of those rat collectors. And then shortly after that, excrement started to pour down Oxford Street. And it was the sewers collapsing, the old Victorian sewers, the old brick sewers. And that was traced to maintenance cuts. And the cost of cleaning that up and restoring it and fixing it were beyond any maintenance that you would have ever had. All of those mindsets have to change. And obviously we've now got to get over this idea that governments don't create jobs. Governments were a major employer in the nation building stages. The Green New Deal is the next major nation building exercise in the last you know, 100 years. And that has to be led by government. And there has to be an acceptance that public sector job creation has to become dominant. I'm building up to it. And the last point I'd make is that in the current debate, there are a lot of, uh, you know, we, we hear a lot, oh, we're going to just have to create a lot of skilled work the Green New Deal has got to create a whole lot of skilled work for workers. Well, the fact is that a lot of workers and the, a lot of workers who are going to be disadvantaged from this are what we have as measured low skill. That doesn't mean they're less people. It means that their, their ability to do complex tasks might be reduced because of their historical background. And that they've got an attachment to the labour market that's very satisfactory that delivers them income security for their families, they make a productive contribution to, to the society and they'll be displaced by this in big numbers. So we can't just think of creating... Not everybody's going to become a rocket scientist. A high proportion of the people displaced are not going to become rocket sciences, scientists. And so we've got to have an inclusive employment framework that allows what we measure as low-skilled workers to be able to continue to participate, to be productive, earn income, have job security, and what we need, therefore, is a job guarantee. An unconditional job offer at a socially inclusive minimum wage to anybody who wants it. And what I mean by socially inclusive, you, you might have focused on the minimum wage bit. I want you to focus on the socially inclusive bit because that means that that person will be able to fully participate in a reasonable way in our society. They can go to football matches, they can go to dinner, they can take holidays, they get, they get pension entitlements, they get sick pay and all the rest of the things. But the social inclusive wage becomes the minimum wage of the community for the, because you don't want those workers forcing up the general wage structure. I'll come back to that later if you like. And I, I'll often I'm hearing in the current debate, oh, we, jobs guarantee, that's, that's going to do it. Well, well, 
in, you know, I'm one of the original developers of this concept within the MMT framework. Well, it's not going to do it. It's just, it's not the panacea of all these issues. It's just one component to solve a particular issue. It's a sort of base level policy structure that any government should introduce. But it's not the, it's not the solution. It's just part of it. And it'd be, it'd be a disgrace, it'd be a, a failing if all the government did to address climate change was introduce a job guarantee. It should do that anyway, even if we had a lovely climate, no climate problem. But we need to do much more than that. The other thing is that we have a very narrow concept of worth in our neoliberal mindsets. And we've, we've, uh, uh, we've constructed the concept of productivity in a really narrow way as being... And it comes from this 1930s concept. Have I got it there? No. It comes from this 1930s concept called the gainful work, worker framework and a gainful worker was constructed as being someone who contributes to profit in the private sector so if someone when we think about productivity we think that they're adding to private profit and that's that's the ethic of our system now my view is that productivity has to be broadened dramatically to reflect social contribution. And so think about this. I would employ... We live uh, just on near the surf beaches on the east coast, in Newcastle, it's on the surf. I'd employ surfers in the job guarantee. Now, what would I get them to do? Well, I could go and surf. But what else would I get them to do so there's reciprocation to society other than them just being happy? Well, one of the big problems in Australian summers is people drown because they don't understand the rips and the, and the, the sea's quite dangerous. And surfers know exactly where all the dangers are. So I'd get them to take school classes teaching them water safety. I'd have all the musicians on who wanted to join the job guarantee on the job guarantee. What would they do? Play their guitars, of course. But what else would they do? They'd have to go into school halls and do rehearsals and talk about music composition and putting together bands and dealing with the egos in bands and all the rest of it. And what I'm getting at is that that's a very broad, a br much broader concept of what we mean by contribution and productivity than the way we conceive of it now. And if we made those if we made those steps, then the the, the policy space available to us to to create uh, income earning opportunities in green space to allow us to pursue the climate issues but maintain the social continuity of employment and jobs becomes massive. That space becomes massive if we think think outside the, and broaden our concept of productivity. Okay, so one of the interesting frameworks that has been around for a while is this donut economy. And uh, I, you probably can't read that because the screen's quite small, but it's, you know, it, it's a really nice framework. It brings in disadvantaged people from the sort of, from the centre of the donut who are missing out. It brings them back into inclu inclusion. It solves a whole lot of uh, environmental, social issues. It puts constraints on our economic and productive behaviour that's environmentally sustainable. So for my purposes, you know, I, I quite like this framework. And uh, more thinking along those sort of lines, those conceptual structures would will help us. But you can see over in the bottom right-hand corner. 
Gosh, that went slow. It has no macro in it. The donut economy has no awareness of macroeconomics, which is where modern monetary theory comes in. And one of the things that continues to come up in this Green New Deal debate is how you're going to pay for all of this. I've just outlined a grand scheme where the government is going to have to take a, a massively larger role in our lives and, our, and generating well-being and massive shift in real resources towards the public sector and huge policy changes to deprive the private sector of access to those resources. And if we're been living in this neoliberal era, this is the question that always comes up. How are you going to pay for it? Because our economists, my profession, has told you that you'll have to pay higher taxes or the government will have to have massive escalation in its debt and the higher taxes are going to be dreadfully negative in terms of uh, disincentives to work and tax avoidance, all the rest of it, and the debt will be suffocating and all the rest of the sort of project fear type stories that we have about this. So this, to me, is the missing link in the Green New Deal debate, that unless we marry it to an MMT understanding then we're going to ask these spurious questions and we're going to conceive of the Green New Deal in such a restricted way because we're so scared that the taxes will be too high or the debt will be too high and governments will run out of money and they'll go broke or the, for the foreign currency markets will destroy your currency because they'll think you're out of control. And this is where we've got to start our understanding, I think to get, a, get ahead of this. So the last few t slides about, are about that. Now, this isn't a lecture on MMT. Uh, it's a lecture about how MMT talks to the Green New Deal. But you can find plenty of my work as one of the developers of MMT on, on the internet, if you haven't already encountered it, uh, to see what, you know, get a deeper understanding. Now, the first thing to get into our heads is that if I showed you the uh, HM Treasury's budget papers, and we pulled out a table, it's got all numbers on it against departmental names, and I'd say, what are those numbers? And you'd probably tell me they're the cost of public action in those particular areas. And I'd look askance and say, you're wrong. We've been led to believe that those numbers that the government announces in its budget are costs. But they're not costs at all, they're numbers. For a currency issuing government, they're relatively meaningless in isolation. The costs of a government program are the real resources that it absorbs. What are real resources? Chairs, humans, trucks, offices, all of the things that are real. The money amounts that are allocated against programs are not costs. They're just numbers. And the context for them is the important point. It's the, the real resources that are diverted. And so a Green New Deal is going to have uh, massive real resource costs. We're going to have to reconfigure all of our public infrastructure, our transport systems, our energy systems, our water supply systems, our university systems. Right across our lives, everything's going to have to be reconfigured to make it long-term effective. And so the real resource costs of the Green New Deal, in my view, are going to be huge. 
Now, then you've got to think about, well, hey, how are you going to persuade society? And what does that mean? That means that it's got a lot, there's going to have to be massive real resources reallocated to this and absorbed into this. Now, if the climate change scientists are right that we've only got a few years to live, whatever, I'm just characterising it in inverted commas, then we, we won't be able to make those real resource shifts in enough time. So we better hope that governments get busy with us as society and gets the transformation going tomorrow and that the climate scientists are a little bit wrong, a little big bit wrong. But that's what the cost's going to be and it's not going to be easy. So you can't just blithely think that this is just a process that's got to be followed. There's a massive political exercise to, to bring in frameworks that tell people who are going to lose access to those real resources, you lost it and this is what we're going to do for you. That's a just transition framework. Okay, so here's a, here's a sort of MMT in a nutshell. As I said, this is not a lecture in MMT. It's just MMT in a nutshell to make you curious if you're not already aware of what our work is. So here's a framework and it, uh, it has on the left-hand cell, does the nation enjoy monetary sovereignty? Money sovereignty is a government issuing its own currency, British government issues its own currency, not borrowing in any other currency, which means that it can always meet any liabilities that arise in its own currency, uh, floating that currency on international foreign exchange markets and having an in a central bank that sets its interest rate. That's a current sovereign country. So the 19 member states of the Eurozone are not sovereign countries. They use a foreign currency. They don't set their own interest rates. So the question, this is sort of a, a, a decision sort of exercise. So, and the other dimension is whether there's idle real resources, that is whether the, the country's fully employed, and that doesn't mean fully employed labour, it means all resources are fully employed. So they're the dimensions, and we'll just this will give you a feel for what MMT, how we think. So if those two criteria are present, then the only constraints on government spending are real. So if you've already got everything fully employed and the government wants to spend more into the economy, well, then it's got a real constraint. It, it, can't, it can't do that without depriving us or, or the existing users of those real resources of that use. So in that sort of situation, there's a quite a difficult thing. How would they deprive existing users? They'd have to reduce their purchasing power through taxes or through regulation, if, unless we have sort of a command economy where we just take them which we don't have and we don't want. So that's a first thing to think about in Green New Deal. If, if we've got everything already employed in polluting activities and non-polluting activities and we want to shift them to the polluting non-polluting activities, then we've got a real resource constraint and we've got to work out policies to make that trans shift those resources to the non-polluting activities. If the economy is not fully employed, well then MMT says there's no constraint on government spending. So the government can keep spending and bringing in resources to productive use without any issue at all, financial issue. So if there are idle resources, then one other thing we know is that the government net spending is too low its deficit is too low or its surplus is too large. So that's different to if the economy is at full employment. So when we invoke a new deal, the sort of uh, way in which government will have to construct its policies will depend upon the state of the economy. It's much easier to make transitions when you've got idle resources because they're not working it now and you can translate, translate them very quickly 
and relatively uh, easily into desirable activities. Now in this situation, a government spending has two constraints. It has a real resource constraint because it's always got a real resource constraint and it's also got a financial constraint because it's got to get the bond markets to lend its money or raise taxes in order to get the capacity to spend and buy the real resources. And so a Eurozone country, in my view, has a much harder task implementing a Green New Deal than Britain has. And if the economy is, isn't fully employed, then that gov sort of government still has a financial constraint. And if the bond markets take umbrage about the current stance of the government's policy and stop uh, f uh, funding you at existing yields and demand higher and higher risk yields, as they did during the global financial crisis to the peripheral economies like Spain, Italy, Greece, whatever, then you've got a real problem. Because if you've got f idle real resources, you know your deficit, your fiscal deficit is too low. But if you try to increase that deficit, you've still got to get the money from some, the currency from somewhere because you've got a financial constraint. It's much harder to do, and which is why the countries that entered the Eurozone, the 19 member states, were crazy. And it's why Maggie Thatcher did one good thing for Britain, in my view, one, and that was to recognise the currency capacity that Britain has and refuse to surrender that by joining the Eurozone. She's... What's that? No, it was Maggie Thatcher who, who early on... Early on... She, no, but in the, in the discussions leading up to the in the 80s, under the Delors process, Margaret Thatcher said, we will never surrender our currency. And so what you learn from that, and these are the last couple of slides, is that for a currency issue in government, there is no intrinsic financial constraint on its spending. So when your politicians tell you that they haven't got enough money, they are lying to you. When they say they've run out of money, they're lying to you. When they say that to improve NHS, they've got to take money from somewhere else, they're lying. When progressives say to you, we've got to tax the rich to get money to defend our welfare state, our health system, they're lying to you. They're, they, they don't, and they're probably lying because they don't understand. You can improve your NHS without taking money from anywhere. And this whole tax the rich argument that the progressive side of politics gets completely enchanted by is to me a sop to just neoliberal framing. Because A, it makes the rich feel as though they're the most important, uh, the most important uh, provider of public services to the non-rich. Well, no, they're not. There was a book written by Anne Rand, who's sort of the libertarian exemplar, who, t who the book Atlas Shrugged is all about this idea that the, the workers are just miserably dependent upon the, the largesse and entrepreneurial spirit of the industrialists. Well, that's what Tax the Rich argument's about. They are irrelevant to the ability of the British government to provide first-class public services right across the board, including addressing the Green New Deal challenges. Now, don't then go out and say, oh, this Bill Mitchell character doesn't want to tax the rich. I want to tax them out of existence. But I don't want to do that because I think I need their money to, to pro provide proper NHS in Britain. I want to tax them because I want to reduce their power to influence and lobby, pay lobbyists to influence the political debate in their favour. That's what I want them to have less resources for, but not to fund NHS. And what we know that is that the British government can buy whatever is for sale in its own currency. 
including all idle labour, without question. And so the unemployment rate that you have at any point in time is a choice of government. It's not something that's uncontrollable or market determined. It's a choice of government. So then you put all that logic together and think about the Green New Deal challenge, those 10 points I put up, then, then you would never ask how are we going to pay for this. You would ask how are we going to pay for this in rural resource shifts, not in terms of what currency outlays we're going to have to make, how are we going to get the real resource shifts going? That's the question that's relevant. A couple more slides. I know I said that before, but I've got a couple more. And this idea of fiscal space, the OECD, the IMF, World Bank, all of these characters are talking all about fiscal space and they employ very smart young people and older people to come up with all of these elaborate measures of fiscal space based upon a, uh, an ill-conceived notion that the currency issuing governments have a financial constraint. They don't have. So all of those things about debt ratios and thresholds and, and ceilings on, on uh, deficits and fiscal credibility rules that the Labor Party thinks is the smartest thing in the world, it's, just, it's the most inane thing in the world, all of those things are irrelevant. The fiscal space that a government has, a currency issuing government has, is what it can buy and bring into productive use. If, there's, if you're already fully employed and all the real resources are already being used, then there's not much fiscal space. And so you have to create it by depriving the existing users of those real resources. If there's a lot of unemployment in the economy, well, then there's much more fiscal space. And it's got nothing to do with the financial ratios, the state of the current budget, the state of the public debt ratio. It's got nothing to do with any of those things. It's what you can buy and bring back in. And this is the really the last slide. And, of course, people will then say, oh, well, what, you, what you're advocating is money printing and don't you remember Zimbabwe and Weimar Republic? And, and um, well, this is a separate lecture, but the inflation risk in spending applies to all types of spending, whether it's government spending, cons household consumption spending, business investment, and investment means building productive capacity, equipment, blah, blah, or export revenue. And the inflation risk is in the spending, not in whether you issue debt or not or, or, or any of the monetary operations. So... If the spending growth exceeds the capacity of the economy to meet that in terms of production, then you're going to be building up inflationary pressures. And if you think about what we've said earlier about the Green New Deal, then the implied spending that's going to be needed to make all of those shifts is going to be rather substantial and will definitely exhaust in any short-run period the real capacity of the economy to absorb it. And so, in other words, to avoid these transition being inflationary, it's going to have to be smaller steps. Not, it's not going to have... It can't be... It's not, it's just, it just hasn't got the capacity to be rapid. Now, then you... Uh, juxtapose that with the, what the climate scientists are telling us and we might have a tension there, eh? And uh, so my view is that the, the, that the Green New Deal is transformative, it's huge, but from an economic... And, and there's no question about the government being able to spend enough to achieve those things. No question. That's not the issue to me. The issue to me is uh, political... Uh, it's dealing with lobby groups and vested interests and it's also making the transitions measured enough to not violate real resource constraints and, and being uh, sober enough to realise it's going to take time and that if you try to rush it, then it will fail 
And now the question I haven't, and I, I won't answer it, the question that I can't answer is have we got enough time for all of that? But, but what I would say is that we don't know whether we have or not, so we better get started today just in case we have got enough time. That's it, thank you. time to do that so um, we've only got one of these oh we've only got one of these so yeah okay uh, so okay the gentleman here do you want to use the mic so everyone can hear? Yeah. Thank you. Hello. All right. Yeah. Just a quick question, really. It's um, a little, slightly off tangent, but it's mainly about MOT, and there's something that's puzzled me really well. What I'd like is I'd like some clear examples where um, MMT has been shown to be predictive, descriptive, based on actual real da world data. If that makes sense? You know, it's a model, so it should be... As I said, this is not a talk about MMT. But whenever I'm talking about MMT, the first statement I make is that it's, not, it's ridiculous to talk, say, when we have MMT or, it's, or when we move to MMT. MMT is not a regime that we're going to shift to. It's also ridiculous to say things like MMT policies are dangerous. Now, what does that all mean? And by the way, there's a bill before the US Congress, if you've read about it or that, that proposes to condemn our work, condemn modern monetary theory as a danger to American society. It's brilliant. What I mean by that is that, and the way I express this, is that modern monetary theory is a lens. So these glasses let me see better as I get older, and modern monetary theory, in my view, provides you with a superior view of what's out there now, of how we understand the monetary system, how we understand the capacity of the currency issuing government within that system, and what are the options available to that. So we're, we're surrounded by it. And... Um, uh, so when you ask me, is there a demonstration of it? Yeah, let's take a walk outside. Yeah. That's that's MMT. Examples where using the MMT ideas shows that people the outcome was what we expected. If if you want to, if uh, take Japan, that's my. When I'm asked if I've got a model, I've got lots of models, but. When, I ask, when I'm asked whether I've got a model, I say, yeah, I've got the ultimate model. It's a real-world, highly asymmetric, highly non-linear model. It's called Japan. Now, Japan had the biggest property collapse, in commercial property collapse ever in the early 90s. It, in, it responded to that by increasing deficits. It had one negative quarter of GDP as a result of that collapse. And all of the, and and it also started to issue a lot more debt to match the increasing deficits. It's now got public debt ratios gross of around two hundred and forty percent, much higher than anywhere else. It's had continuous deficits with few blips for nearly thirty years. Now, a mainstream economist who's studied macroeconomics in university, in our universities today, using the standard textbooks, would say, would have predicted, and they did in the 90s when this was all starting to unfold, they, would, they predicted that Japan would have... Oh, and by the way, the Japanese government... Uh, Japanese uh, Bank of Japan was also buying a lot of government debt and now holds about 44% of all government debt. And since the RB period has bought almost all of the issued government debt. So that's what we call money printing. And the mainstream economists all predicted the following, that interest rates would rise sky high because of the call on the debt markets 
by the government. There was such a strong demand for the higher debt, the competitive forces would drive the interest rate up, that Japan would have accelerating inflation because of the amount of uh, debt that the central bank was buying and that the bond yields of government debt would go sky high because of the rising deficits, the rising debt levels, and the bond markets would, would realise soon that this was a government that was going to run out of money and wouldn't be able to pay back its debt, and so they would increasingly demand higher risk premiums, that's yield rising, as time passed. Now, do you know what's happened in Japan since? Do you know what the interest rates have been for 28 years? About zero. Do you know what's happened to bond yields? Well, in our 10-year bond is now negative. In other words, the bond investors are now paying the Japanese government for 10 years. And do you know what's happened to inflation in Japan? Virtually fighting deflation, not inflation. Inflation scuds along the zero line and then occasionally what goes negative, that's deflation. So it's exactly the opposite to what mainstream economics predicts and it's exactly what modern monetary theory predicts. It's 100% correspondence, that's the fact. Yeah, that's what's getting. It's yeah. examples like that where, you know, the, the classical... Sorry, it's exactly the examples like that where classical um, economics, the accepted um, uh, model... Um, is predicting exactly what didn't happen and where MMT can be shown to 100%, predict. 100% at which point then you can probably then say MMT lens is, is, is a good guide to the future. Uh, um, it helps. And the other point is at the height of the global financial crisis in the early days, everyone was predicting with quantitative easing that there'd be, there'd be accelerating inflation. We, MMT economists, it's all on the public record, we said there wouldn't be any inflation arising from the quantitative easing. The governments who run their own currencies would never run out of money as they were pushing in stimuluses. The mainstream economists said that as, as a result of these rising deficits and rising debt ratios, government yields would go up. Well, the only time they went up was in the Eurozone and that was because they don't, those member states don't hold their own currency. So they've got credit risk default. But yield, 10-year bond yields in Japan are negative. In a, a number of countries are negative. Now, no mainstream theory predicted that. MMT predicted it 100%. Uh, I gathered from your talk that um, from the beginning you said that um, the, the Green Party would just close down coal mines but then you'd need to compensate people with money. But if you've got, say, a, a collapsed local economy and then you're handing out money, you've got an inflationary situation. And at the end, you said that you, you need a proper transition. So are you suggesting that we need to build the, the tidal power and the wind farms and get them established with workers before you close down the coal mines, etc.? Yeah, I mean, when I said close down the coal mines uh, with sunset clauses, the, I, in Australia I advocate 20 years, a 20-year transition. But you just can't close them down overnight, unfortunately. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I was living here when you did that. that I was living through the miners' strike. And we would, we would scud down to the northern Welsh beaches from Manchester to try to get coal because all of our hot water and showers was driven by old stars. No, I mean, this is, an, this is not an exact science what we've been talking about today. It's an art form and it's really, it's going to be a really tricky thing to get these transitions smooth. And if we just do things without forward planning and without adjust, slow adjustments, then we'll make these sort of mistakes. And so, you know, in, the, in my region, the Hunter region, which is the coal, a coal region, I've been advocating for years that, and we've had decline of manufacturing. We had a BHP Steelworks was the major employer, not coal. BHP, the big steel company, that was the major employer. And they, they walked out. And I had, and it's all, it was all of this skilled trades labour in Newcastle that just became 
uh, well, they they became nothing really. It was shocking. But but I've been advocating that we should be invest. The government should be investing to create a, a renewable energy hub in Newcastle to build up skill, use these manufacturing skills that are that were there to 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 be manufacturing of you know, whatever, blades. And so I'm not an expert on those things, but, you know, and build up training skills in uh, maintenance workers who are going to make... and uh, administrative workers and all of this. And that can be done while the coal industry has 20 years to close down. And that's, you know, and it's not exact. I don't, you know, I haven't got a blueprint. And it's going to take a better brains, brains to, than I've got to do all of that. But it's a, it's, that's why I say the problem is it's a slow process and the emergency seems to be now. It's a really big quandary. Thanks, Bill. Um, on your sort of 12 pillars of what would be kind of in the Green New Deal, um, things like the job guarantee... It could be more than 12. Yeah, okay, in the ones that we went through, there was things like the job guarantee... Um, abolishing um, financial market speculation. These are sort of things which I'm sure you'd like to just see implemented anyway and as part of um, policy seen through an MMT lens. Do you see the climate issue as being the only game in town in terms of creating the kind of huge political shift required to implement things like the job guarantee, abolish uh, radical changes to the financial markets? Um, in the same way that we moved to neoliberalism in the 80s. Yeah, that's, that, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. I've got the mic back now. Power when you've got a mic, I'm told. Um, that's a great question. And the answer to it in, in one sense is that I think those things should, should just be part of, even if there was no climate emergency, we need those things. But... Uh, the second answer, part of the answer is that it's clear that we haven't had those things, even though pain and suffering of neoliberal austerity and, uh, you know, the shift of power to corporations and the, 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 the shift from government of being mediated between capital and labour and an agent of capital, those things have all happened and we haven't been able to get those things despite the you know, our, our communities falling apart, our life, you know, I, I, I can't believe how many council libraries have closed in Britain as a consequence of government cutbacks to the council grants and stuff. And so we haven't been able to break out of that yet. And so I'm thinking that we need... A, and I thought the global financial crisis would do it. I actually was really wrong about that. I thought that this is it. Bill, your time in the sun's coming because this lot are going to go... But I was wrong. No? There's incredible resilience in the in the elites of the system. Now, I, I think that climate issue, which is bringing together uh, cohorts in our population that don't normally talk very much together, and I'm thinking the, the the youth and the old people in our society, they normally have separate agendas. They are now a force together. And so I think climate, I think climate change, we're, we're going to, we're going to reach, we're, we're working towards getting to a dynamic where we're going to demand action. And all of these marches, you know, in Hobart in Tasmania, 10% of the population were out there in force the other day in the marches. That's a huge thing. And so I, so I think it's going to be climate change that allows us to get all of these other desirable things. Unfortunately. The fact that we've got a, perhaps a travesty to do. Yeah, easy one. Uh, how well are you getting on with the Labour Party? <laughs> uh, here am I. Here, over there they are. Look, uh, I think the British Labour Party is cooked. That's my view. I think, uh, and if you read my uh, blog post this morning, you'll start to get a feel for that argument. Um, you know, and I've had talks with John MacDonald uh, last year, and um, 
I, I just think they're looking like uh, yesterday's paradigm. And I think that... Uh, uh, and, you know, I'm not a political scientist, so I'm not skilled enough to make sort of astute judgments about whether their tactics are about Brexit and all of that are good or, or smart. You know, I, I suspect they're stupid, but, but, but that's not an official position because I'm not... But uh, uh, by tying themselves to a fiscal credibility rule as if it was a, a smart thing to do to stop the city of London closing down your currency is just pie-in-the-sky delusion. And I said to John last October that he re- the British Labor Party hasn't really learned anything from the fiasco of the mid-70s when Gordon... Um, hmm? Dennis Healy, sorry. Dennis Healy and James Callaghan told the lie to the British people that they had run out of money and were going to, had to go to the IMF to get money. That was an absolute lie. And, you know, one of the, one of the interesting things this, in the last week, on last Monday I was in Paris talking to some, one of the really biggest investment bankers. And last Thursday I was, and Friday I was guest of PIMCO, which is the largest bond trader I was guest of their European branch in Germany and then Frankfurt. And what they, what they told me, and these are the guys that do all of this stuff, not the Labor Party advisers who sit drinking their whiskies and uh, exhibit paranoia on a daily basis. The guys who actually do the currency trading are, are desperate for return now because they've got negative interest rates, they've got negative deposit rates in the Eurozone, they've got 10-year bon- and 20-year bond yields that are negative. The pension funds and the insurance funds have got what, what is called uh, uh, increasing mismatches in their maturity. And what that means is that their, their cash flows on their liabilities are not being matched by the cash... They've got long ca- liabilities... And the cash flow on their short on their assets are too short, not enough. And so to bridge that maturity gap, what they're doing is increasingly taking risky positions to generate more return on their assets and thereby increasing their exposure to financial collapse. And these big investors that have got trillions involved are are, are, are are incredibly worried that there's going to be major pension fund collapses and more more insurance fund collapses, and they're desperate for things to invest in that will deliver them secure returns. And so, you telling me that a country that's that's uh, investing heavily in public infrastructure and uh, has and training and skills and latest technology and and all of the innovative uh, stuff with increasing skilled workforce, which provides incredible crowding opportunities to private investors, are you going to tell me they're going to drop your currency? They're going to be lining up to get get hold of investment opportunities in your country, independent of whether you leave the EU or not, and hopefully you do. Political statement. (laughs) So that's the point. Hi, I'm almost scared to speak <laughs> my, my, because my background's got nothing to do with monetary theory or banking or any of that stuff, and it's all a complete spider's web to me. <laughs> yeah. I so, say to people, if you've studied economics, you're not going to be able to understand okay. so, so my background's in health, and my, I spent 40 years looking after or looking, caring for people with profound and multiple disabilities to whom money means nothing. So my question is, if we start with people and what people need, and people need somewhere to live, something to eat, uh, people to care for them, um, then why, we need to almost break the link between work and income. And one way of doing that is to provide universal basic incomes to people. So I just wondered what your view was on that. <laughs> right, I- <laughs> well, just say if it's a good idea or not. <laughs> Look, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, and all of the things that you you all of the things that you express concerns about 
can be accomplished within a sophisticated concept of productivity and gainful work. And my two-minute tirade against UBI starts now. <laughs> and stop me when minutes <laughs> got a clock on. Um, first of all, the progressives who advocate UBI say we can't do anything about the unemployment. It's a, it's a source of poverty. So therefore we can't create the jobs we need to create to overcome the source of poverty and that is to create, give people an income. Well, as soon as you adopt, accept that logic, you are, you are buying into the neoliberal story that the government can't create the work. So to me it's a neoliberal construct and why do you think the CEOs of some of the worst firms with respect to workers' rights, like Amazon, are advocating UBI. Any, any time that, that someone like that advocates something, I get suspicious. That's the first point. The second point is that it constructs... It's an individual construction of a systemic problem. The systemic problem being the lack of jobs which we know that the government can resolve if it wants to. It's a political decision, not, a, not anything else. So it's, this, it's playing into this individualism that, we, that neoliberalism, neoliberalism has encouraged because collectives are very dangerous for elites who want to grab more of the real income and have us having less because collectives lead the trade unions and that sort of political activity. And so this individual construct then gets expressed through the policy as treating the individual as a consumption unit. So as long as we give them a dollop of, dollop of cash so that they can go to the supermarket, we just want them to piss off and stop hassling us for work. Well, I don't accept that because in my job I've got lots of friends, I've got social identity, I've got satisfaction that's measured in the same cultural values of the rest of the society, that I, that I met my wife in the workplace, I've got a social network from the workplace, I travel and meet all people like you guys. If I've got a UBI, I'm sitting around in Newcastle, progressively my social network shrinking and I'm becoming alienated and dislocated and a consumption unit. Why would a progressive advocate that sort of system? Now, hold on, one last thing. And what I can't explain in, in the remaining of my two minutes <laughs> is that the real problem, they're, they're all sort of genuine problems, the real problem is that it doesn't, and this is too technical, but you just have to, if you're interested, read my work. It provides no inflation anchor for the society. Modern monetary, uh, job guarantee is an inflation anchor. Now, you won't, that, just hear what I say, and if you're interested, go and read up on it. So, if you have, what it means is, if you have a UBI at such a level that people have an inclusive life, it would be highly inflationary. So to avoid the inflationary impacts, you've got to make a starvation level. And, and to me, that's problematic. That's all. You had one. Uh, well, I just wanted to say that um, m my observation from my work is that people are trapped in the welfare state and universal basic income is being put forward as a way of getting people out of the welfare state. Yeah. So don't, don't hear me wrongly. Anybody who cannot work, who's too old, who's too sick, who has mental illness which precludes them from any participation, they get fully supported by, in my world, by the government at a proper inclusive support, not some half ass support level. But I have the value system that anybody who can work has an obligation to society to use their productive talents to contribute to the well-being of all of us while they can. And as reciprocal right 
the government has a responsibility to make sure all of those people can use their skills and receive plaudits from using their skills and self-esteem from being part of a collective and contributing. That's my view. Yeah, Carol. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, thank, uh, the famous one, yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, so, um, can I just um, tell people uh, about a book launch? Uh, I want, I, no, but I want um, Chris Williamson to know about it because um, it is. It's it's about. It's written by Greg Philo. It's um, half past seven at Waterstones, and it's uh, about what he is experiencing. Um, Greg Philo is a, um, uh, an academic. He's um, a Glasgow uh, media something or another. And the book is something like, um, I, for I keep forgetting the bloody title, but it's about the witch hunt, basically, and how the media has sold that. The reason why I can't go to the, you know, the, the, the thing with Chris, and this is what I wanted Kristen to know, is because I'm going to a policy seminar where I hope that John McDonnell will be. Last night, I went to a fringe meeting where James Meadway was on the panel, and also... Paul Johnson from IFS, yeah, and um, Paul, so they were going on about all this, you know, what they their wonderful um, plan and everything that John Dole has, and um, sticking to the fiscal rule. Paul Johnson turned around and said, "This is rubbish. You, you, you won't. You, 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 it's just not going to work. All right, but." Can I just say the good thing, okay, at the end, I went to see one of the other panellists, um, uh, Annalise Dodds, who's on the Shadow Treasury team, uh, who's very good, and I went up to her and I said, can we come and see you again um, about, um, and talked about MMT, and I'll take someone with me, um, perhaps we'll see you in Oxford, okay, and she said, oh yes, very interested. I've been reading up about MMT. And she said, Jonathan Reynolds, who is also on the Shadow Treasury, he also is actually looking. So don't despair. Thank you. The last thing I'd say about this is that if the fiscal credibility rule that the Labor Party thinks is their genius trump card against the City of London will bring grief to it in the first recession that they counter if they ever get into government. It's neoliberal, central, and it will really backfire on them. I wondered if you could say a bit more about the transition period, the time you mentioned, 20 years, and, and we're being told that it's much more urgent than that. Why, 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 why does it take 20 years? Why, why can't it be done in five years or ten years? Because you can't. Uh, you, unless you want to... If, if, if as progressives we want to be equitable and fair as part of the deal, well, then we've got to honour certain pre-existing things that were done in good faith. And there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of contractual things that go out 20, 30 years. And I don't think it's our right to, uh, you know, to, to just trample on those things. And, well, they may be able to, but, you know, I, I think that it's going to take time. I, I can't give you an exact... It's not going to be tomorrow. Yeah, sure, we could, just, we could just announce tomorrow that all coal industry in Australia is finished. Yeah, you could do that technically. Yeah, but 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 then you'd be so sued by in the for breaches of contract, and then you can say, okay, you'll legislate all of that away, and then you're sort of on the slippery slope to authoritarianism. It's not the way I like to think of the problem, but I think it's a huge problem, and urgency is the issue. So the fast track you can do it, the better. <laughs>